Good evening, everyone. I am Yvonne, the co-director of operations at The Forge. And firstly, I'd like to apologize for not starting on time. We've had some technical difficulties, um, and that was the cause of the delay. We, s we sincerely apologize for everyone who joined us on time. <coughs> My job this evening is to welcome everyone and to also welcome our speaker and to also introduce the forge and to introduce the talks um, and what the talks are about. So I'll start with introducing the forge. <laughs> so the forge has two spaces. So where we are is the forge, which is the event space, the community space. Um, and then across on 14 Reserve Street, we have our bookshop, which is the commune. Um, and I'll say just a little bit about the goals of the Forge and what our broad mandate is. So the primary goal of both the spaces is to create a space for communities or sets of communities for the articulation and discussion of progressive ideas. But also in this work, we also want to be able to develop um, solidarities. So, and we are in Bramfontein, the biggest student district in Africa. So the idea is to be able to work um, with students and also people who work um, in different um, institutions of higher learning. But also we want to, in our work, work with people who are in um, progressive popular organizations, such as trade unions and social movements. Um, but more importantly, as part of our work, it is crucial for us to engage the lived experiences um, and the struggles of working class and impoverished people. Um, and you are here today um, to be part of one of our programs, which is the introduction to ideologies. The idea with these talks is for them to do exactly this work, to be able to, um, to do the work of the Ford as being a space of inquiry, but also um, a space of solidarity, because with these talks we want to bring people um, whose work you know, does a variety of things, people in trade unions and social movements, uh, but also people in, in universities, but also in stu uh, people who are students. Um, and so the idea with these talks is that they become um, an introduction to particular ideologies. And today we start um, the series with Pan-Africanism. And, and the other ones will be feminism, Marxism, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll announce to the public you know, which talk is coming up next. And today we are really honored to have as uh, the first speaker <laughs> for this introduction to ideology series of ours. So this one is the inaugural um, talk. And we are very happy and feel honored um, that Dr. Vashna Jagannath was able to be with us today. Um, she's an incredible comrade. She's a wonderful th uh, thinker. She's a wonderful teacher. Um, and I'm sure today that we're going to really enjoy um, the presentation. So I'm just going to read her bio, and then I'm going to sit down. <laughs> um, so Dr. Vashna Jagannath is the director of both Pan Africa Today and Friends of the Workers. She is also the Deputy General Secretary of the Socialist Revolutionary Workers Party and works in the office of the General Secretary of the National Union of Metal uh, Workers of South Africa, um, which would be NUMSA. Uh, Vashna, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, we really are delighted to have you today and we look forward to the talk. Um, so just a, um, a few announcements. Please may we wear our masks throughout the talk. Um, and also please can we put our phones on silent. Um, and also thank you so much to everyone joining us through our live stream option. Um, and yeah, so now I'm going to sit down. I'm not necessarily going to facilitate the discussion. So after Vashna has given the presentation, we can move straight to the Q&A. Um, thank you, and over okay. to you, Vashna. Great, thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be here today, and honored that it's the first one and I get to do it. Also, I think it will make my task easier, because if I'm not as 
up to scratch as everyone else. You'll have no benchmark to measure me against. So I can set the standards very low. There's no pressure. Um, I was asked today to speak uh, to something that I've thought about a lot over my lifetime. I've worked on in various ways in my political work, but also in my educational work. And that is the area of Pan-Africanism. Uh, given my own political leanings and ideology uh, of being a communist, I'm obviously much more interested in, a, in one particular school within Pan-Africanism. And that is something that I would speak to most today about. Uh, because it's an introductory lecture, I can't cover it. It also happened to be the most dominant stream of Pan-Africanism over the 20th century period. So I think um, given that I have about 30 to 35 minutes, this talk will be a very introductory talk. I would like to just make that clear at the beginning and at the outset. However, I guess in our Q&A time, if there's particular questions that comrades want to ask me that I haven't covered or any areas you might be interested in that I must expand upon, I'm more than willing to do so within the time constraints that's given to me for today. Um, I, the, the, the talk will begin, I think, mainly looking at, at the very particular type of Marxist-Leninist Pan-Africanism that develops throughout the 20th century, really becoming quite popular around the period of the 1940s during the various anti-colonial movements. I will also then want to speak to, I think, um, some issues around imperialism and colonialism. I think it's and slavery. I think it's absolutely vital that we cover those topics and those areas because that comes in direct relationship with Pan-Africanism. And Pan-Africanism itself as an ideology is in constant dialogue with these huge global movements of oppression and exploitation. So I think it's very important for us to do that. In that section, I will also cover the different types of colonialism that we have and some of the differences between imperialism and colonialism, as we don't often have a discussion around that. And one of the reasons I think that's important to cover is because it also then demonstrates the different types of pan-Africanism that arise and also the different types of nation states that arise in the post-colonial African context. So I think that's very important. I'll also speak to some key events, particularly uh, slavery and then the Haitian Revolution. The Haitian Revolution is one of the key moments uh, of African solidarity and the coming together of people under, under this banner of African unity. And then I will go on to looking at the meetings and some of the leadership within Pan-Africanism and then ending um, after speaking a bit about the development and formation of the OAU, looking in particular at the 1970s and the sort of third world solidarity that grows out of Pan-Africanism and perhaps touching a bit on Cuba in the end and looking at the various sorts of solidarity that was sort of demonstrated to South Africa. And I'll end the story there because largely with the formation of the OAU, the kind of political project of Pan-Africanism gets fairly hollowed out as it becomes bureaucratized and instrumentalized through this body of the African Union. Uh, however, there is still other iterations of Pan-Africanism that is happening throughout the period and right up until now, as we know, and a resurgence around this. I just uh, also would like to point out that the reason why I actually started engaging on this in my intellectual work when I was at the university was precisely because of the lack of transformation around the curriculum, around the ways in which we think about the continent we live in, around the ways in which we think about political work, but also very importantly, around the ways in which we think about Africans as intellectuals, which is often like missing from the story of the continent. People are very happy or content or fine to talk about African people, leaders as actors, as physically doing things like fighting a war or being in politics. There's very little discussion about the intellectual and ideological work that goes into that. So someone like Kwame Nkrumah is just seen as a nationalist leader. And the fact that he has a PhD in philosophy and two double masters and has written in depth about consciousness, consciousisms 
as well as pan-Africanism, as well as the class struggle in Africa and its history, that is not taken seriously. So I think that is also something we should think about exploring here today in terms of the intellectual work that pan-Africanism has done and thinkers of pan-Africanism has done, both philosophically in the humanities, but also on economics, someone like Walter Rodney, for example. So um, yeah, we can go to the next slide, thanks. Um, I think while my story of pan-Africanism begins in the 19th century, I think we have to look at earlier versions of pan-Africanism that has developed and that was in, in, in place both during the sort of early periods of colonialism and at the beginning of slavery. One of the key movements of pan-Africanism in its early days was what came to be known as Ethiopianism. And this sought to think through the ways in which you could pull together different people in a much more religious way around this banner of African unity. Okay? And we see, still see strains of that even today. We have, so what's so interesting is all of these different ideologies that have developed over the last three, 400 years still have strains in the modern world. They still continue in different ways into the modern world. And then you have something called the Sons of Africa in London. This is very interesting. I want you all to think about this, right? If, if there was no colonialism, imagine a world where there's no colonialism or imperialism, okay? And you are living on the continent of Africa. What do you think you would call yourself? What, what, what would you call, how would you identify yourself? Have you thought about that? Because you can shout out some answers, it's fine. What, what, what would you, what, what do you, how do you think you'd identify yourself? In relation to? You, you, you often, people identify themselves in relation to something else, right? You make yourself in relation to something else. For example, a gendered identity. You know you're a woman because you're making yourself against a, a man, right? So you are not those things, so you are these things. And that's how you gain your identity, whether that's right or wrong. Now, for people to make an identity, they usually do it in what is surrounding them. So if you were looking at a pre-colonial society, it's very likely that you would be making your identity against the person in the next community who's across the stream and the river, rather than making yourself as a one big unit. Okay? And you find that happening all the time. We know this. We have different ethnic groups. We have different linguistic groups. We have different cultural groups. However, the notion of Africa is an old notion, and it comes into being from largely from people in Europe who are imposing ide a, a geographic identity onto a group of people. They're not so much interested in a question of race in the ancient world. It's more what is beyond Carthage, which was the ancient, the ancient land in what is now Tunis. So that was the key, the key sort of moment. However, what begins to happen is, with imperialism and colonialism, people in the, what comes to be the new world, which is the Americas, Africa, Asia's. And it's not the new world. It's always been there, right? And the Europeans didn't discover it. There's this thing, like, you know, in school, you're like, oh, the vo exploration, the voyages of exploration. Oh, you know, Vasco da Gama discovered this. Like, no, what, before that, we all were just like lying around, comatose, doing nothing. And then he came and we woke up. No, that's like nonsense. They were just like, they were just like, well, I would like to call them sort of, you know, pirate hunter gatherer type people who were looking to trade. That was what they were looking to do, was to make money and exploit. So, and they always knew that there was all of these things in the world. They just didn't know how to get to it, okay? And so, what is really important is that when this encounter begins to happen between Europe, which is actually a fairly new part of the world because technology is around sailing, around navigating the world get to Europe fairly late. It gets to Europe only in the 1400s and just late 1300s. Meanwhile, if you looked at parts of East Africa, North Africa, the Middle East, China, people were trading in what was called the Indian Ocean trade routes for centuries before that. And it is only through them getting their hands on those maps from Arab geographers that they now are beginning to think about how to, 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 to navigate the world 
because before that in the Middle Ages, they did not know how to navigate the world. And they would only trade over land on what comes to be known as the caravan or the silk route. Okay? So once this begins to happen, there is a discussion or there's discourses that begin to other people. And hence you get terms like the Africans, the Indians, the native Indians, the this and that, right? You have to you have to compartmentalize people and other them, and you give them a universal term. And what happens then is when people from Africa or even Asia or parts of Americas go to Europe, to the metropoles, to the sites where the colonizing masters live or the imperial masters live, they themselves now have to identify themselves and find unity with each other because they are now separated. So in finding unity, this identity comes together. And for example, the Sons of Africa in London is one such thing, where you are trying to find unity from different parts of the continent. Ordinarily, you would have never met. You might have not had unity. You might have been at war. But this situation now is forcing you into forming unity in new ways, finding new terms to unify yourself. And I think this is so important, because we t if we tend to think of things as being primordial, as being inherent, then we can't find commonality and basis of unity. And actually that, as people who are working class, who are exploited, who are oppressed, and we are all working class, not all of us are workers. We don't own the means of production, right? If we did, I, I don't think you'll be sitting here if you own the means of production, right? It, it, we don't, we don't. So we are all being separated. We are all being split apart all the time. So you need to find these concepts. And this is the work that this ideology is doing. This is the work that people are doing in a system that seeks to split you apart and create hierarchies all the time. And then you have another example of this, which is the Kubona. Guano in, nine, in 1791, which is a, a, an individual from the Sons of Africa in London who writes a book which is largely on slavery. Okay? And he has a huge campaign about this. And he's not the only person. We know in the abolitionist movement of the slavery, the, sla the slave abolitionist movement, there were many people who were writing, like Equiano, who was an ex-slave, who wrote about his experience of slavery. There were many Africans writing about the evils of slavery. One of the things that happens often is when that narrative of the abolition of the slave trade is told, the Africans are written out of it. I'm sure you all might have learned about Will, William Wilberforce and all of these individuals. There's films made about, about them, right? About how they freed these slaves. The idea is that as Africans, you can't think about your own liberation and liberate yourself. You need someone to come and tell you how to be liberated. But there's many examples of ex-slaves and people who are never slaves talking, writing, and thinking through the evils of slavery. So this is another key moment when people come together in telling the story. However, for us, uh, you can change it. Uh, the, the key person that we are going to be interested in who began what we call Pan-Africanism, who coined the actual term Pan-Africanism, was Henry Sylvester Williams. And he, made the, he, he developed this term in 1897. He was a historian, and he was from um, the, the West Indies and the Caribbean. And I think, you know, I always, I'm always so surprised in my mind by how many amazing political and intellectual thinkers of the world come out of the Caribbean. It's like absolutely, and obviously brilliant cricketers too. But the, 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 the intellectual work is absolutely astounding and amazing. And if you think about people like W.E.B. Du Bois, you think about Henry Sylvester Williams, you think about, uh, someone like Marcus Garvey, even Malcolm X's mother was from Guyana, and you find all of these traditions going back into, into the West Indies, into the Caribbean, where there's amazing thinkers around liberation, around the radical liberation of people's lives, come, they come from there. And even today, contemporary thinkers such as Lewis Gordon, who is a fantastic philosopher, considered to be one of the best in the world, comes from the West Indies and comes from Jamaica. So I think you know it really has something there. I, I always wonder what it is that we could capture from there so we can begin to replicate it in other parts of the world and possibly, hopefully, in the United States itself.
for example. Um, so he develops this, and he's developing this idea of a pan-Africanism around a notion of having a conference and a meeting. And this is in direct response to the Berlin Conference. Right? The Berlin Con Congress that happens in 1884 and 1885 was a key moment in our history. It's a moment when they sought to split up Africa and divide it as sort of property of various European states. And so it's in response to that that this notion of unity is really coming into being. And the idea is to have a conference in order to challenge this. Okay? And I'm going to stop there for a bit in the story, because I want to go back and begin to tell you why, they, how you reach this moment of 1884 and 1885, where Europeans think that they are powerful enough now to decide which parts of the African continent they control, and who lives where, and to name it as they will. Okay? That story is not an, a simple story. It's not a story of people just arriving and being more advanced and being more sophisticated than people who are living in Africa or any other part of the colonized world. It's a long story that stretches over a space of close to 400 years. If you think about it, the first time someone like Vasco da Gama arrived in, uh, in, in, on the southern tip of our, of our own country was in 1456. So it takes this period of close to like 400 years before the full subjugation of this continent can happen. And I think we should really take that on and take that seriously. Because that demonstrates that people weren't easily being taken into colonialism. People weren't easily just being controlled. There were struggles and there were fights. And it was a 400 year struggle for people to develop this power over the continent of Africa. And I think it's important for us to recognize that, because if we do, we will recognize the agency that we have, and that we can struggle, and we have struggled, and there was no inferiority in the system, that there was a struggle constantly. Even if you think about the history of South, South Africa, right, from when, uh, you know, the 14, 14, whatever, 64, whatever, I'm terrible with dates, when Vasco da Gama, Bartholomew Dias, and them decided to come to when the, the sort of, until 1910, right, with the 1910 and then the 1913 Land Act, it is only with the 1913 Land Act that you are able to get African people to become disciplined labor. Again, another space of 400 years. Because in that period, people are struggling. In that people, pe period, people are rebelling. In that people, period, people are actually victorious in many ways. So we need to take that on, and we need to understand that history as well. If we gloss over it, we lose all of that rich knowledge we could be gaining in our own struggles for today. So I think one of the key things is for us to begin to have some clarity around definitions. Right? So we understand how systems work. Imperialism and colonialism, people often use it interchangeably. But it's not exactly the same thing. Okay? Imperialism is a sort of, is, is basically the, the, the ability to try and take power. Right? You're trying to increase your influence over something. Whereas colonialism is the actual use of military force and the conquering of a space. Okay? So that's the difference. That is why today we can still say we have imperialism, even though we have so-called independent nation states. Because you seek to influence and have power over a society. You don't have to have a military presence. You don't have to have a government. You do it through the economy. You do it through social norms. You do it through cultural norms. You can do it through Hollywood. There's a variety of ways you can imperialize over people. And that is why places like the United States of America and so on are so influential. Okay? And so I think that is really important. And Edward Said, who is a very famous Palestinian scholar and uh, activist, who, well, late, he's passed on many years now, he, has, he, he makes this really good distinction between what is imperialism and what is colonialism. He says, imperialism involved the practice, the theory, and the attitudes of dominating metropolitan center ruling a distant territory. So they're just ruling over there through ideology and so on, and through their attitude of mind. However, colonialism 
refers to the implanting of actual settlements in the distant territories. Okay? So that's very important. And then you can go into the next slide and click twice so that the, yeah, perfect. Okay. So what happens is colonialism then becomes this actual movement of people into a space. And now on Af in Africa, we've had different moments and different types of colonialism. And at the same time, while we had colonialism, we also had imperialism. And this is important for us to understand because it's important for you all to know why, for example, the Congo today looks different to South Africa. Okay? Or why does Tunis look different to South Africa? Why does Morocco or, or Mozambique look different? So there are different types of colonialism. But one thing that colonialism had in common once it implanted people into a space was that it had three key things. I call it the three pillars of colonialism. Right? It is the media. Right? And in those days, the media obviously was not television, but the newspaper. The newspaper was absolute king. It was y'all's Twitter and y'all's Facebook, and every, it was where people got the information. It was where it shaped people's imagination and lives. The other thing was military force, right? We know that. And then the third thing was the missionaries, okay? so religion. These were the three key things, and they were used in different ways. For example, missionaries were used to come and actually proselytize to come and convert people to Christianity, hence following a particular religion and thereby thinking that that religion is superior and falling into line with thereby thinking you are inferior because now you have found the superior religion. But also what the missionaries did was they actually looked for legitimation in the Bible for colonialism, for imperialism, for slavery, for racism. Okay? So the, that's how these things were used. And you know what's so interesting is that um, a lot, if you look at these three things today, not much has changed in, in the world, right? If you look at the key things that shape our lives in the world, it's the media, it's the military, which causes wars all over. If you have the strongest military, you're the most powerful country. And it is religion. Now, obviously, it's more diversified, but religion is still being used. If you look at the ways in which the wars were being fought in the Middle East, uh, the, the, the discourse of religion was used. If you look at the ways in which you have fascism rising, right-wing governments rising in the world, like, for example, in India, they are using religion to do this. If you look at what's happening in Brazil uh, and in Venezuela with the rise of right-wing governments, they are using religion and religious discourse to do so. Right? In, in, in Bolivia, in particular, they've done that uh, and at the great expense of the sort, of the sort of native populations, religious practices, and culture. So I think that is something that's so interesting, is that the system continues. We might have different people doing it. They might have new names for it. You might be called CNN now. But it's still the same sort of systems of power that are in place that continue. And then in addition to this, you have different types of colonialism. Okay, uh, And you can change it here. Yeah. So the different types of colonialism, you have, so you have imperialism, then you have colonialism, and you have different types of colonialism. You have, firstly, what's called settler colonialism. Okay? And that is very evident to us here in South Africa. We know what settler colonialism looks like, right? Uh, I mean, when I was, uh, and Yvonne can speak about this, when we were in Grahamstown, unfortunately, for many years, uh, teaching, it would say, welcome to settler country, or something like, proudly settler. Uh, so settler colonialism is when you move a large population of colonizing people to live in the colonized space. And that doesn't happen everywhere. For example, South Africa is a settler colony. The United States of America is a settler colony. Australia is a settler colony. New Zealand is a settler colony. Right? Now, those, those, those areas, are, it's important to understand this because the post-colonial context of those areas look different to places that weren't settler colonies. Okay? Because the, 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 the job of the colonizer now is not just to extract because they've actually put people there. Never mind it was their poor working class people or the poors that they didn't want. 
and who they had exploited enough or prisoners or people who they deemed unworthy in their own society. The fact was that they now needed to lift their lives up. Okay? And so they created infrastructure. They created all of these things in settler colonies. Okay? Then you have, for example, exploitation colonialism. This is like an incredibly sort of, um, it's a very, 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 very heinous uh, system of colonialism where there is no attempt to make any investment into the space that you are colonizing. It's purely extractive. It's purely you are there to take. For example, Congo is a key example of this. And hence the condition in Congo today, which is so bad, and that also the moment of the assassination of Patrice Lumumba. But for example, if you look at Congo, Congo was the personal property of King Leopold. And all they did was they built a road to the mines and to the fort and extracted and took. Right? So there was no infrastructure. There was nothing built. Hence, a post-colonial um, uh, Congo looks very different to a post-apartheid South Africa or a post-colonial South Africa. Then you have surrogate colonialism, where, for example, you have um, a settlement, but you also have that the colonial power is being supported by a large group of people who, who are from the colonized population. right? So we know this very well. Uh, you'd have people like, for example, under apartheid, where you had people in the form of Bantustans who would be working and actively supporting the apartheid regime. Okay? Uh, you have in India, for example, during colonialism, an entire Indian uh, administrative system manned by Indians for the British. Okay? And the British actually developed this policy under um, Education Minister Edwin McCauley. And he says what the intention is, is that we don't want to have to keep on sending our British soldiers and our British people to go and die in those colonies. What we want is to educate the colonized subject so that they become like us in every way except how they look. And therefore, they can rule in our stead. So we don't have to actually even have to be there anymore. They will do the work for us. And this is not something that we should not have a deep discussion about or think through. Because the various ways in which what Fanon talks about with the comprador bourgeoisie, the petty bourgeoisie, and the development of bourgeois democracy comes out of individuals who have been trained in this way. Okay? So that is also something very important. It has repercussions in the post-colonial world. Then you have what's called internal colonialism. And that, we know that very well in South Africa. People would, uh, would sort of classify apartheid as a sort of internal colonialism. A lot of people today classify uh, Palestine and Israel that's as an as, as internal colonialism situation. So there's different types of colonialisms. And because of that, the struggles in each place look different. And in places where there are less where the state, the colonial state, is less absent. Doesn't mean it's not more destructive. Sometimes it's more destructive. The places that it's less present in can form solidarities, can form revolutionary wars and organizations differently to where the colonial state is very present. So for example, if you took South Africa, when the ANC had the underground movement of Mkonto and Suzwe, did they have military camps in South Africa? Anyone? No, they didn't have military camps in South Africa, right? You had them all in the neighboring countries, okay? All the way up to Algeria. Right? But if you were, for example, in, um, I don't know, if you're in parts of the Congo, you could, right? Because you could have places to hide. Like if you take the Cuban example, uh, you know, Fidel and his men held out in the Syria Masra for three years. They couldn't find them in the jungles. Now, why is that? It is because, for example, in South Africa, the colonial settler state was so in charge of the land that they had captured the land so totally and measured it out and had a full audit of the land that there was no way you could actually hide. Right? So when you went underground, it wasn't like going into some jungle. There was no jungles. They had tamed the landscape. They had control over everything. You had to go underground in plain open sight in different ways. Whereas in Cuba, for example, you could go and hide out in a jungle for three years and no one will find you. So there's different ways. And that's very important because that then impacts on the ways in which people 
to begin to think about pan-Africanism, begin to think about solidarity and how to fight back against colonialism. Okay, so that's very important. And then the key feature of colonialism, I think is this, uh, you can go on to the next slide. Huh? The key feature of colonialism and what actually gives rise to the modern world is the transatlantic slave trade. And this is vitally important as well to our story of Pan-Africanism. You cannot have a story of Pan-Africanism and understand it without understanding the Atlantic slave trade. And I think that we need to really take this seriously because often Africa as a continent is written out of the modern world. It's written as if it's backward, as if it has to catch up, as if it's not in, 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 in touch with Europe with the Western world, with the United States of America, for example, right? And this is something that, 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 that is done to, to dehumanize the people of the African continent, to say that you're not of this world, to say that you're not part properly modern. And by modern, I don't mean some desire to be like you German or speak English in a particular way or something. By modern, I mean the contemporary, that you're not part of this contemporary. But what everyone seems to forget is that the contemporary world is made by capitalism. This is absolutely vital. Right? And what makes capitalism is slavery. Slavery forms the basis and provides the wealth for which people can actually develop their capitalist power. So people in Britain didn't take slaves themselves. They took slaves from Africa and put them in America to work on plantations, and they benefited. So they could then turn that capital into industrial power and build capitalism. Okay? So this is absolutely vital. Now, how can you tell people who are at the foundation of building this new world, this modern world, that you are out of it? But it's only because of you that it's been built. Okay? So that is a story that is, gets told, the media, once again. And the media doesn't just mean news and Donald Trump's Twitter feed. It means intellectuals, academics. They write it like this, as if you are outside the world, as if your contribution does not matter. The fact that the United States of America is rich today is because of slavery, nothing else. So they write that out of the story. Okay? The fact that Britain is rich today is precisely because of all the gold. Do you know that more than half the gold ever mined on this earth comes from the Val Triangle. More than half the gold ever mined on this earth. Right? Just from this area. Okay? And we, we, we have, we have what, what's our unemployment rate now? It's like ridiculous. Right? In parts of South Africa, it's 47%. Okay? So why is that? Because we don't have that gold. It's sitting in parts of the world where they don't have a 47% unemployment rate. Okay? So this is really important. And what happens in slavery is there are different periods. And I know I'm going on a bit. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll try and make it quicker. Right? Uh, and so when, when, you, when you look at slavery, there's different periods. In the early slave, early slave period, there was no attempt to take care of the slave. Right? One of the things that happened was when you were taken into slavery, the main thing was that they separated you from people who spoke your language from people who came from the same area as you, because they didn't want you to unify. So that you can't speak the same language with people and so on. You can't unify. So people are separated immediately off from each other. Families are split apart and so on. And so you're taken to different parts and different plantations. But what begins to happen in parts of Latin America, and not the US so much, is that there are people who are escaping out of slavery and joining native populations and living with native populations. And there's a special word for them called marinage, which will be on the next slide, and we'll talk about that. But in parts of North America, it's continuing. And because you are now turned into property, into an object, your body is the machine. This is why slavery is different to exploitative and oppressive forms of labor. Right? I don't know if any of you have been following. Last week uh, was an anniversary for in South African Indians, indentured laborers coming to work in South Africa. And some people were calling it slavery. Right? It's not slavery. And when they talk about slavery, they mean this, the transatlantic slavery. They don't mean pre-Roman like slavery and all of that. They're talking about this. 
The reason why it's not slavery is simple. Firstly, you are kidnapped and taken by force. There is no contract of labor. There is nothing to exploit. Your body is the inanimate object, and your body is the machine. Whereas with labor, like even whether it's indentured labor, whether it's migrant labor in the mines, it is horrendous, it is exploitative, it is oppressive, it kills you, all of those things, but you are still in a contract. You still have some agency, even if it's one hour a day, <laughs> to do something with your time. Whereas a slave, you don't have that. There is no end time. It's for perpetuity, and all of you is exploited, not a part of you. Whereas when you are an exploited and oppressed laborer, it's a part of your time. It can be a large part, it can be a small part, but it's a part of your time. It's not your soul, your spirit, and your whole body. Now that's what slavery does to you. So in America, immediately you are turned into an object. This also means that you cannot have relationships with anyone. You cannot have children. You cannot form bonds with people. Love gets taken out of the equation. Can you imagine? It's like deeply inhumane conditions. And the reason for this in the early days is, well, they had an endless pool of people that they could draw on and take them from Africa to go and work. And if they died, they died, we'll just bring more. Okay? But when the abolition of the slave trade happens in 18, I think it's in 1823, that means you can't take slaves anymore from Africa to the Americas, but you can still have them there. It changes once again. Now they need to breed their own slaves. Okay? So in order to do this, they now encourage people to have relationships. They encourage them to have children. But you're still property. So for example, one of the key figures of the sort of movement of solidarity that we can still call radical black history and pan-Africanism, someone like Sojourner Truth, who was, an, who was a slave woman, she fell in love with a man from a neighboring plantation, but could not have children from him or marry him. Because if she did, who did the child belong to? Because it's property. So which slave master owns this child? Right? So those are the kinds of conditions that have been created through slavery, the dehumanizing conditions that are created through slave, slavery, which creates the modern world, which creates capitalism. It's those same dehumanizing conditions that get replicated on our continent, not through slavery, but through different forms of exploitation during colonialism and imperialism. And it's the constant splitting apart of people. It's the constant splitting apart of people from each other, from family members from each other, from people in terms of class, ethnicity, all of this. And the reason for that is it makes it easier to govern people who are split apart from each other. A lot of the times the British or the French didn't actually have to fight. They would just provide weapons to do two different warring groups who would fight each other on their behalf. Okay? So much easier to manage because you don't have a unified force. But what begins to happen is people within the slave populations now begin to, over time, rebuild and reconstitute their life. And this is such an important thing, because it shows what humanity can do. In the most difficult conditions, people can reconstitute themselves and make a life for themselves. Okay? Whenever we think about things like cosmopolitanism or cosmopolitan, if you hear the word cosmopolitan, what do you think of? Anyone? Huh? A city, the magazine, beautiful people moving around, traveling, all of those things, right? Cosmopolitan just means to be from the world, like of the world, to have a, a, a wide experience of things. And it's usually the reserve of the rich and the elite. It's never about poor people being cosmopolitan. But if you had to look outside our city now here in Johannesburg, what would you find? You'd find the working class from all over this continent here. So are they not cosmopolitan? Will they appear on the pages of Cosmopolitan magazine? No, they don't appear in those narratives. Right? In the same way, the slaves begin to develop a very cosmopolitan identity. It's an identity made up of what they find in the Americas, in an engagement with the native populations, what they find coming from their different slave masters who come from different parts of Europe, as well as their remembered and recollected histories of what they have. 
And that's how they begin to build unity. They begin to develop new languages. And very importantly, one of the key things, for example, in North America that they develop that's very cosmopolitan is food. So something like what comes to be known as soul food in the United States of America is highly cosmopolitan. It's made up of all these different things, the beans and the chili and so on from North Africa, the sort of uh, deep fried foods from the Scottish, and the various plantains that they find in America, corn that they find in America. All of these things now come to be on the plates of African Americans. They begin to build a new culture. And then what they do very importantly <clears throat> is they take religion, which was used to oppress and exploit, and turn it into a liberatory tool. And this is very important, because yes, the story of religion is one that's problematic. But we also have to think about the ways in which people then take it on and use it. And the reason being is that as a slave, one of the few places you could actually go to and be free on a Sunday was to church. So it was a way for people to come together and begin to form unity. And those are the early beginnings of what grows into a notion and a sense of African identity. Right? And it's coming from this part of the world. We can go on to the next slide. And what's so important at this point, and it's so early in the story of imperialism and colonialism, we don't ever think about it. Right? In 1791, just remember, by this point, they hadn't even come to Transvaal, the, the colonizers. The, story, the colonizing story of the Transvaal had not even begun in 1791. Yet, in 1791, already, slaves were rebelling. So you know that narrative when you meet people and they say, oh, but it was off the time. Or well, someone's racist, but it was off the time. You know, you can't help it. It was from that time they were racist. No, because you always found people who were not racist in that time. So it's not off the time. Right? And you've always found people, no one was ever willing to accept slavery. It wasn't like they had to reach a moment and get consciousness. That's, that's wrong. They knew they were exploited. They knew what was happening to them, and they didn't like it. And the main thing that begins to happen is in 1791, you have the Haitian Revolution. And it's happening directly at the same time as what other revolution? the French Revolution. So it's happening at the same time, because these people who are slaves, ex-slaves, are in dialogue with what's happening in France, and understanding that there are claims about the dignity and the right of man. And they are saying, well, what about our rights? Aren't we, aren't we men? To the same French government that's fighting for its own rights, becomes independent, then they say to them, well, what about us? We are also French citizens. Because when France has been formed and developed, they don't have a king anymore. So how do you develop national identity when you don't have some person to rally around, one individual who's appointed by God? Why would you go and fight for, in a war? What, what would be your reasoning? You have to find things that unite you as a nation. One of the key things that they found was language, the French language. So wherever you are in the world, if you speak the French language, you are French. Right? And so slaves are speaking the French language. So they begin to make these arguments. And it, very, very quickly, what begins to happen is, you know those communities of people I told you that escape slavery? And they go live in different parts of you know, North America and the Caribbean, the Marunage communities. They remember, and they have early, early notions of organizing that they bring from the continent with them. And what begins to happen in this point is, Slavery by now, the slave, the slave masters are a bit lazy. They're not really separating you. So what happens in a particular period just before this revolution is masses of slaves from Central Africa, from the Congo, are taken to Haiti together. Much easier to build unity, much easier to remember, much easier to recall. And hence, this movement of liberation begins. And it's led by someone like Toussaint Louverture, who's one of the key leaders. Jacques, Jean-Jacques Dessalines is another one. And by 1804, they get independence, and they defeat the French. And they get independence. And in fact, it's on the back of this that you begin to make that argument for the abolition of the slave trade. Okay? But in addition to this, what is really important is they're now independent. And this part is so important, because this is our lives today. This is the story of the African continent right now even now with COVID even more so, 
right? You know, Chicho Mboweni is going on and on and screaming and shouting about the World Bank and the IMF and loans and this and that and how he wants to make our lives worse. Uh, this is the reason why. The moment the slaves get their freedom and independence, which they fought for and defeated militaristically the French, they are told, y'all were our property. By you becoming independent now, you owe us a debt. And you owe us a debt. In 1825, it was 150 million francs. Because you are our property and we're giving you independence. You need to buy. So Haiti had to accept those conditions. And that is why till today, Haiti has never recovered. That is why till today, Haiti is a disaster zone. Right? Because now it's worth 21 billion. That's what that debt was that they had to pay, repay. 21 billion for fighting for their own freedom to France. Okay? And they've been paying that debt. And they only finished paid like in the 1940s. But then they had to re indebt themselves after that again. Right? So this is how it works. And this moment becomes a key moment as well for the unification and ideas of unification in what comes to be known as the radical black tradition, whether it's intellectually, politically, and so on. That's why when someone like Thabo Mbeki was president, his lineage and his thinking about the world goes all the way back, of Africa goes all the way back into Haiti, right? And coming into the now to think through. So all of a sudden, you begin to see how the story of Pan-Africanism is not a, a small story. It's not a, a, a local, it's not a parochial story. It's a big story. It's an international story. It's the story of the modern world and the history of the modern world. And that's where its place should be. It shouldn't be at some side thing. And this is what irritates me. I used to be, I mean, I am a historian. I used to teach at a university. If I wanted to teach Pan-Africanism, it had to be some side thing somewhere. Why is, why is it that we have to have African studies departments to study Africa? But we have history just to study European history. Why can't it just be history and we study everything in it? Why does there have to be a separate section for it when it is part of the world? It makes the world. The fact that the Haitian Revolution happens in 18, 1804 is directly the reason why I am sitting here today. Because after the abolition of the slave trade, they had to put in indentured, in, indentured labor systems. And they were worried that their sugar cane plantations weren't secure in the Caribbean and the West Indies. And they had to look for new places to plant sugarcane because sugar was such an expensive commodity. And Natal, KwaZulu Natal was one place. And that's where they brought indentured Indians to. So that's how my ancestors came here. That comes directly out of 1804. Okay? So you see how all these linkages, it's like an absolutely amazing story. Go to the next slide. And it's out of this that we then return once again to this. And the Caribbean obviously just features so prominently, Henry Sylvester Williams, and I'm, I promise you I'll be done in like 10 minutes, I'm sorry. Henry Sylvester Williams, they, they have the first conference in 1900, okay? And the Congress is held on between the 23rd and the 25th of July, and it's held in London. Okay? The reason why it's held in London is because at the same time, there's something called the Paris Exhibition that's happening. At the turn of the 20th century, the European world France, Germany, Belgium, England would keep on having these exhibitions. And they'd have these massive exhibitions, and they would ha bring their colonized peoples and exhibit them. Okay? So I don't know if you've heard of human zoos. That was a key thing that was coming out of this. That was like, that happens right up until the 1950s in Belgium. So they would bring all their colonized subjects. But they'd also have talks and so on, and then they'd have the more educated ones. So it was a way for people from cheaply who are already coming to the metropole to Europe to come together. So you had this meeting because all of them were already going to be in Paris. So they decided to have the meeting in London and come together and have a discussion about what was going to happen. And there were 37 delegates in here. And you can see them all. And right there, you can see W.E.B. Du Bois sitting down there. And that's very exciting, OK? Uh, the most important probably think of the 20th century and the father of so sociology as a discipline. So you have these participants there. They're from, some of them are from Africa, a smaller portion. But in the main, they are coming from the West Indies, the US, and the UK. And I'll tell you in a minute why they were still, it was still less then. Okay.
So these are, you can go to the next slide. Some of the key participants were people like Samuel Coleridge Taylor from, from the West Indies, Dada by Naroji from India, WBE Du Bois, and Anna Julia Cooper, key, key intellectual, African-American woman, first woman to get her PhD, absolutely amazing life. I can tell you all about that some other time. Just a genius of a woman. She presented a fantastic paper at this conference as well. Interestingly enough, when people talk about Pan-Africanism, they don't tell the story of women enough, as usual, in this. Uh, there's a whole lecture series that I've done before on the women, in particular, within these movements. And you had people like Alexander Waters. One of the key things that they were wanting and their demands was that, for example, they wanted to hold accountable the colonizing states and the metropoles and the places like United States and the UK to begin to take on the conditions of slavery that were ha continuing, but as well as the new conditions of exploitation and oppression that was taking place in Africa, especially in South Africa. South Africa featured very prominently in the early documents of this Pan-Africanism. And it's very important for us to remember this. We can go on to the next slide, because what we, dis what we, what we, what we begin to understand is some of the mo three of the key leaders from that first conference including Henry William Sylvester himself, come and live on the African continent. And Henry William Sylvester moves and lives in Cape Town. So it's vitally important, like that story, that early story of the official movement of Pan-Africanism is so deeply tied to South Africa. He lives here for three years from 1903 to 1905, and he works as a lawyer in South Africa. And then he returns uh, to the West Indies where he, where he dies. But why that's important for you all to note is because from 1900 till 1919, there's nothing much happening in the Pan-African movement after that meeting. They begin to form smaller chapters. They start publications. But because the leaders are so separated and they don't come together, they are, there is not much movement happening. And you find throughout the 20th century, this is the story. But once again in 1919, it's taken up again, and you have the next conference, which is in, um, which is happening in Paris, and this is really to think through a lot of the issues that's happening around colonialism, especially beginning uh, around to deal with what's happening in the Gold Coast, which is today Ghana, and so on. Then you have the second one in 1921 in London, and you have key leaders that are coming together in this moment. Uh, people who were at the first Congress and people who are now newly coming into the movement, people who have immigrated to Europe to study and so on. However, from then, you find that there is, from the 1920s till the 1940s, you find there's a, another period and another gap within the Pan-African movement. In the 1920s, it was still very much around what politics was in those days, a politics of petitioning, a politics of requesting, you find that even in South Africa within the ANC. But from the 1940s, there's a more militant turn. That's what's happening globally as well. So that's the form that it takes. But what's very important that happens in the 1920s and begins to change the way, and for the first time introduces into the discourse of Pan-Africanism the question of economics in a very serious way, is the impact of the communist revolution in Russia and the first international. So those two events really begin to shape the thinking around Pan-Africanism. And now for the first time, the documents are beginning to talk about the socialization of the wealth, the exploitation of labor, and the unification of workers in the world. So that's really key. You go to the next slide. By 1945, you have key young leaders now beginning to join the Pan-African movement. George Padmore, another person from the West Indies, born in Trinidad. He was a Pan-Africanist and a socialist. And by now, someone like W.E.B. Du Bois himself is a socialist. So they are coming together in London. They are thinking through what does it mean to be a Pan-Africanist in new ways. One of the key people that George Padmore then meets in this period is Kwame Nkrumah. And it is out of the discussions and the intellectual work that they both are doing together that you have the revitalization of the Pan-Africanist movement and the new Congress in 1945. 
And it is at this moment that this Marxist-Leninist pan-Africanism comes into being. That is much more looking at colonialism as a system, but the alternative is not just liberation. It's a very particular type of liberation and socialization of wealth. But that's not the only pan-Africanism that's there. You must still remember there's still the sort of schools of pan-Africanism that's more nationalist coming out of the Garveyite movement led by people like Marcus Garvey, who's no longer alive, and so on. So you still have that. But this is something that, that is growing and is basically the roots of what becomes the organization of African unity. So this is the fifth, sorry, you can change the slide, the fifth Pan-Africanist Congress, where you can see now the new leaders that are here, right? And right in the end, sitting there with his legs crossed, is Kwame Nkrumah. And Nkrumah is really important to this movement. He's really an amazing internationalist. And what you find now, all of a sudden, is you remember in that first Pan-African Congress, they were mainly Caribbean and American. Here, what you find all of a sudden is that there's mainly people from Africa. And many of these people go on to lead the post-colonial independent African states. You have Jomo Kenyatta. You have people like Hastings Banda. You have Kwame Nkrumah. You have Ken uh, uh, Nirere. You have all of these people in these meetings. Right? sitting down. And it's so interesting that they then, from these congresses, then go out to lead the various African countries. Very importantly, W.E.B. Du Bois is still here at the moment. And it is for out of this movement and the political will of people like Kwame Nkrumah, and Kwame Nkrumah is then, there's a decision then taken to send him back to Ghana to begin the battle. Right? And we know that Ghana gets its independence in, 19, in 1957, and Kwame Nkrumah becomes the first president. Immediately in this period, you see that there's lots of countries. It begins with India in 1949. It gets its independence. And immediately after that, very quickly, there's a toppling of all these places. And it's not, yes, it is the, it is the agency and the work and the struggles of the colonized people, but also the British are beginning to realize imperialism is a bit cheaper than actual colonialism, too. So there's this toppling up of all this. And what begins to happen in the period of the 1950s and 60s is a broad sort of front of third worldism that is very much influenced by internationalism out of communism. And it's very much influenced by this idea that we need to now not, we need to find our own independent way. And Krumah has a famous thing. I don't look east. I don't look west. I look forward. It was like the third way. So it was the non-aligned movement. That was the way for these new powers to negotiate themselves in between the Cold War of the United States and the Soviet Union. But they were deeply backed by the Soviet state in many ways for resources and so on. So it is out of this, once he becomes president of Ghana, that he really takes very seriously this move to build an international movement of solidarity. So Ghana is in the OAU, it's in the Pan-African movements, but it's also in the non-aligned movement with countries from Latin America and Asia. And it's in the what comes to be known by when the Cubans get their independence, the tricontinental movements, right? So this begins and it gives rise to, in 1963, you can change the slide, you have the formation of the OAU, the Organization of African Unity. And this kind of bureaucratizes and formalizes the Pan-African movement. Okay? And it's very important. I'll read this, and then I've got one more slide, and I'm done. I think it's very important that I read this, what, what Nkrumah is saying, his hopes are. Because what begins to happen very unfortunately is the minute people come in to be char in charge of their own nation states, there is a struggle that no longer, all of a sudden, the borders become important because now you are in charge. So this notion of unification is falling away. And the radicalness of what Nkrumah had envisioned for the unification of Africa falls away. And that's why you have a much more watered down OAU with far less ability to have a united front. And that's why we still see the outcomes of that today. He says here, I'm happy to be here in Addis Ababa on this most historic occasion. I bring with me the hopes and the fraternal greetings of the government and people of Ghana. Our objective is African Union now. There is no time to waste. We must unite now or perish. 
I am confident that by our concerted effort and determination, we shall lay here the foundations for a continental union of African states. A whole continent has imposed a mandate upon us to lay the foundations of our union at this conference. It is our responsibility to execute this mandate by creating here and now the formula upon which the requisite superstructure may be created. On this continent, it, is, it has not taken us long to discover that the struggle against colonialism does not end with the attainment of national independence. Independence is only the prelude to a new and more involved struggle for the right to conduct our own economy and social affairs, to construct our own society according to our aspirations, unhampered by crushing and humiliating neo-colonialist controls and interference. Right? He said this in 1963. He could actually be saying it like right now. And it would, have not, it would just be the exact thing that's happening. And so these experiments that were so important just lost power. And that's something we can discuss. Why? How does this happen? What happens to these movements that were so, in the 1960s and 70s, that were so important to building unification on our continent, to imagining an alternative way of the world? What has happened to those alternatives? How does it get crushed out of us? So this is what begins to happen. And Kwame Nkrumah is, is very, very strong on his word. He offers solidarity across the continent. Also, very importantly, WBE Du Bois comes and lives in Ghana. George Padmore comes to live in Ghana. He begins to create a pan-African world. He begins to create these amazing centers of learning and universities. That's why till today, probably the best academics that come out in the English-speaking world of the African continent probably come from Ghana because of those centers of education that he invested in building, right? And the ways in which he thought about it. So one of the key things he, he, he spoke to, and this, he refined his notions around pan-Africanist Marxist-Leninism, comes out of his discussions around poli political consciousness, which is a very philosophical text around consciousness and our being and the self. He also does the deep history of trying to understand the history of class in Africa. This is why he's important, because what Nkrumah is doing is he's using Marxist theory as a tool to understand Africa. He's not imposing Marx's examples and theories onto Africa. That's what people often do, and that's an error. Because the history of Africa is different to the history of England. The history of Russia itself was different to the history of England. So Lenin, when he was, doing, when he was trying to understand Russia, didn't understand it through the lens of England. He had to understand it through the history of Russia. So that was one of the tasks that Nkrumah under, undertook, was to write this history. I mean, can you imagine our leaders today deciding to run a country and sit and write histories that are of deep economics about our country? I mean, could you imagine Trump doing that? It's just like, the, I mean, the biggest farce on earth. Like, we've come so badly down. It's terrible, very depressing. But don't be depressed. Just be excited to be mobilized. So the other thing is that one of the key things, you can just change the slide, one of the key things that also kind of epit epitomizes this moment of global solidarity, and I wanted to end on this note, because unfortunately, due to the very, very sad and untimely death of Maradona yesterday, is this notion of this third worldism and this pan-Africanism that is so wide that it encompasses places all around the world and people from all around the world. So one of the key things that we need to discuss and think through is the role of Cuba in Pan-Africanism. The actual solidarity that Cuba gave the African continent in very real terms, in terms of resources, in terms of training, in terms of military coming and fighting. I mean, you know, basically at the Battle of Kuta Carnival, Cubans just took home body bags, right? They, they, they actually gave their, their soldiers to fight for our independence, and not for anything, not for our oil, not for our diamonds, not for anything, but in terms of solidarity. So if you want to think through what does a pan-Africanism mean, would it be a pan-Africanism where you're in solidarity with someone who is from the African continent but doesn't mind exploiting the Congo and the resources of the Congo? Or would it be someone who wants to defend this continent and unify it for the majority of its population? So I think that's where I would like to end. Sorry for taking so long. Thank you. Okay. 
I think there's a mic here. Right there. We'll need the mic. Is there a way to make things brighter, like so I can see people's faces, or not? Or is it just? <laughs> Thank you uh, for the lecture. That was very insightful. Um, I just have a question mm -hmm. um, with regards to the types of colonialism you listed. Mm -hmm. And um, you listed um, exploit, um, exploitative um, or exploitation colonialism. Um, and especially what, what struck me in that definition was the fact that it was almost um, looking at uh, the struggle of resources, human and natural, for uh, labor in order, you know, to produce capital in metropoles. Mm. And um, looking at today's um, time, like in this in this modern world, um, even just cities um, regionalizing, and um, cities becoming the center of attention, and urbanization happening, and people leaving, you know, to find work. Um, um, in cities and opportunities only being in cities. Um, would you not call that um, some sort of um, exploitative um, colonialism that is happening and manifesting itself um, in today's time? Because also when you take into account the fact of um, rapid urbanization and how also um, it's obviously, um, you know, taking the stance of, you know, this new globalism phenomenon and now the actors and um, the world banks and uh, all of these multilaterals actually imposing you know um, policies um, for us and is that not also you know that sort of imperialism where they actually even the lobbyists actually are now telling governments what to do because they give the money mm -hmm. um, so yeah I just wanted your view on that <coughs> okay thank you Thank you so much for that lecture. I think you really delved into this idea of colonialism. Um, I think it was really shocking how, even though I am an educator, I'm a lecturer, um, teaching what's known as liberal arts, I do try to think through colonialism and imperialism. Um, I hadn't really delved in that deep because I myself was unaware just you know of the complexity um, and really hadn't thought about articulating it in the way that you have so thank you for that and then you forgive me my mind is a bit rusty because of lockdown yes <laughs> <laughs> but i'll try to make sense <coughs> sorry i just wanted you to speak more about uh, a comment that you made about the distinction between slavery um, not between slavery and indentured labor i'm more interested in the experiences of labor um, you know, during apartheid, so especially in, in, in the mines. And I think we, d we can agree that um, slavery is fundamentally different from those experiences in that it's a, an explicit objectification of the black body. But um, I think we cannot speak of black labor. And I say this because the figure of the black, not only in the Americas during slavery, but globally, um, is a, is it's removed or unthought of in terms of um, sorry, humanism. It, sorry, it's what? It's, uh, it's removed re re from not removed. <laughs> I think maybe objected is the word yeah. um, from, from humanism. And Sylvia Winter speaks about this, yeah. right? So we cannot speak of a black labor, um, even though there may have been a contractual agreement. When you look at the process of conscription um, and the actual experiences um, of black life in the mines and how disposable those bodies were, mm -hmm. I personally don't believe that you can speak um, of labor but in, in those ter terms. So that ex uh, black people in that context don't have agency. Um, even though their experiences 
or aren't captured um, as explicitly as the experiences of, of slavery. You cannot speak um, of a subjecthood in definitive terms. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to sure. ask for you to speak more about that. And it, also because um, we've been speaking about Marxism, um, and I'm personally skeptical you know, of a Marxist pedagogy. Um, and even if you look at the decolonial framing, that comes from this understanding that the Marxist pedagogy cannot capture and it cannot liberate the fl figure um, of the black. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Cool. OK. Can I start with those two? They're quite big questions. OK. Um, I think, OK, for, uh, let me start with this first, because then it also then can answer some of the other questions that we, we, we are looking at. I think what we need to, the story, OK, so OK, actually, let me just, I'll, I'll try and answer both questions together in a, in a way. I'll try and answer everything in all in one, so, because the story is linked, to, and the questions are linked in together. Because one of the things, firstly, we need to understand is that colonialism and imperialism are is not, is not something external to capitalism and to the formation of capitalism and to the formation of what comes to be known, well, in, in its early days, mercantilism and then capital, okay? And yes, I, I, I am a communist, so my view of the world comes through understanding economics, comes through understanding the social, but I am a, I'm also a cultural Marxist, so I'm very different to, to other Marxists. And also, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a black South African woman. So my idea of Marxism is very different to what we often encounter at universities. So the ways and the readings of my Marxism comes from within the black radical tradition. People like um, CLR James uh, and so on. So I think that's something I just want to put in there. But just to get to this point around colonialism, resources, imperialism, urbanization, and labor, I think when we begin to look at colonialism and imperialism as a stage within capitalism and as part of the system of capitalism, we then begin to realize that actually we get new names for things, but the conditions, the basic conditions remain the same of exploitation, of, ex of oppression, and so on. So the sites of extraction might change. Right? So for example, in South Africa, increasingly the site of extraction for wealth is no longer the mines. Right? And it's no longer the mines because the gold's too deep underground and we don't have the technology to get to it. Right? It's now finance capital. It's now supermarkets. Right? And with finance capital, the site of extraction is then the human being because it's through credit and the system of credit that you now become the site of extraction. It's not through your labor selling, but it's from what you are borrowing. Okay? So that changes in that way. In the other way, you are absolutely right about the question around urbanization, in that it, in, 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 you know, most of the world will be living in urban centers than they are in rural spaces. Okay? And what does that mean in terms of exploitation, in terms of sites of power and resources? I think. When you create regionalisms, you begin to create internal colonial sites, so sites of internal colonialism. And that power relation that, that can, de then gets created is now a new type of, like a new predatory system that's created, a new system of you needing and things from other people and being reliant. So the liberatory aspects comes out of your life. So for example, if we look at the history of South Africa, when, when we had the 1913 Land Act, the first thing that happens is that people are rendered landless. And the minute you are rendered landless, what happens? You, you are rendered powerless. And that's when you become an object of labor. That is the moment you become an object of labor. All right? So this is not a new story. Okay, and this is where I think the, the question of labor and race is so important. And this is where I think most Marxists fall short, is when they don't want to take the question of race and the intersection of race and labor seriously and the repercussions of that. Because Sylvia Winters herself, as a Marxist, would takes that very seriously. 
right? So what happens is mainly the question becomes a class question about labor. And they're not at all interested in how race intersects and how people's bodies become objectified in particular ways that renders them labor that is not, that is not important, that is useless, and that is actually more surplus, even more surplus to the system. That's effectively what begins to happen to the black body. Right? So what you have is in the story of capitalism, which begins largely in Western Europe, in England and in Germany and so on, is the enclosure of land and the rendering of people in Europe landless. So that's the first thing. So I know, you, know, you remember the stories of Robin Hood and the merry men who lived in the forest and they have to pay taxes and they have to do all these things. The reason why they become outlaws is because they're now being kicked off their land and they become immediately, what's the word we have in South Africa and everyone's so concerned about the rhinos? Those people that have go and kill the rhinos are called what? Poachers. Right, so you all of a sudden have all these poaching problems. Robin Hood and his merry men are poachers because they're now going onto land that they used to live on, that's been stolen from them, that's been enclosed. Now the law says that they're the problem. Okay, meanwhile, that land was stolen and they've been doing what they've always done. Yes? Land invaders. Yeah, land invaders, all of these things, right? So that is the birth of capital. This is why the land question is so important, because at the heart of capital is the enclosure of land, and the first commodification is the commodification of land. Land gets commodified, and it gets commodified all over Europe. And all of those people are rendered surplus when they are taken off the land. Like in 1913, when people were taken off the land and put into reserves, they were rendered surplus. The minute you're rendered surplus, you now have to sell yourself as labor. And that's what happens. Right? And so that's happening in Europe. And they sell themselves as labor. And then I don't know if you'll remember your Charles Dickens stories, Oliver Twist, Sir, Can I Have Some More, and all these things. The factory conditions at the birth of capital in England were so horrific that children used to be chained as young as six years old to machines and work all the time consistently. We have tea time. Why do we have tea time? I'm sure you all want to eat food now because I'm talking too much. We have tea time because it was much easier to get the worker to continue standing at the factory, at the machine, and drink tea with lots of sugar. And the sugar came from the slave plantations, so you took slaves there to make cheap sugar, so you could literally fuel your industrial working class. And they didn't have to have an hour lunch break. They could stand at their desk and drink tea with lots of sugar and continue working and have higher productivity. Okay? And so the English working class become othered. The Irish become othered in various ways, and there's a long history of this. What you will find so interesting is if you go back and look at the documents of when England colonizes Scotland and Ireland, those are the first two places it colonizes, it doesn't use the discourse of race. But the word tribe, the word clan, all of those things come from the colonization of the Scottish Highlanders. And when they do it, they say the problem with these people is that they live too close to nature, so they savage. Right? The other thing that's wrong with them is that their houses are like round. Usually you build them into the hillsides. They're, like round. They're not square, there's no logic to it. So that shows they're closer to being like animals. And what is so interesting is like 600 years later, when they are looking at the Eastern Cape and they are trying to make an argument for the inferiority of closer people, they say it's because they're living in these round houses. They use the same documents. But now that same discourse becomes highly racialized. Okay? And the difference is that when something becomes racialized and racism within the black radical tradition, there's a moment in which you understand it to be born. Because once capital, capitalism has exploited the land and has done what it needs to do in Europe, it needs to look for new markets, continuously new markets. And so it, ex it moves. But what, why, why would someone in England need to go and want to kill some person living in America it never met or didn't meet? Like, people aren't inherently evil. I don't, I don't believe that. Right? There's a discourse that has to be created that's based in pseudoscience, which is called science. It's based in art 
It's based in literature. It's based in plays. I mean, if you, if you read, for example, if you think uh, there's a fantastic book by uh, Silvia Federici, feminist Italian Marxist, where she's looking at Caliban, the character of Caliban in Shakespeare, and the witch, and the notions of the witch, blackness, witch, evil. You find this all over. Edward Said writes about this in terms of art, and how the black slave is shown, or how the oriental is shown as an evil person. So there's this whole project to other people from the 1400s, from the mid 1400s. And that is really when race is created. Because you must remember, before this pre colonial, pre modern world, in ancient Rome, for example, you know, Hannibal was African, but Hannibal was not considered a barbarian. Hannibal was a king. Who was considered a barbarian were Germans, because the notion of other was based on culture and language. That begins to change, because now you need a particular type of labor that's going to fuel your economy and your vastness to grow and expand. And that's when slavery comes into being. And that's when the inhumanity of it comes into being. Because it's not only African people that are enslaved, but you are absolutely right. In the global imagination and the ways in which our bodies, the African body becomes red is as a slave body. And that is because of the deep cultural work that imperialism has done in that way. In the same way, capitalism and imperialism has done the deep cultural work of entrenching patriarchy in society through religion, through a variety of things. So we can't even think outside of it. And I think it's very important for us to understand that deep structural, the deep structural damage that racism does and how it is needed to build capitalism and how it's needed to keep people, certain people in power. But we must also know it begins at a particular time. Because if we know that, then we know we can end it. And I think that is more liberatory. Because we need to smash it and end it. If we think that's how it always is, then how are we going to smash and end it? Like, for example, you know, when you're talking to a man and you're trying to explain to him why you're not inferior, and they're like, oh, but you know, it has always been like this. It's in the Bible. Like, well, so you know, it's always been like this. It is such a, a, de, a delegitimating, it's a de-empowering, a disempowering narrative that gets thrown at you. Now you have to do all this legwork of demonstrating, no, but actually there's this, and there's this systems, and this is what's been done, to undo that work, right? It's a lot. And I think it's what, what the issue is in terms of race, labor, and subjecthood is that the issue is not Marx, or is not Marx, and certainly not Lenin. Because if you look at the history of communism, Marx and Lenin, Lenin in very particular, takes the race and the question of race absolutely seriously, and colonization and the role it plays in that. And later on, even Mao in China. But the issue is Marxists. And Marxists always tend to want to ignore race, because the Marxism in the 20th century has been dominated by who? People who look like me, people who look like you. No, it's been dominated by white men, right? And it's a very uncomfortable discussion for them to want to talk about race and to want to talk about gender. So black women do not feature in their discussion at all. The, the, the subjecthood of black women, the ways in which your lives have been exploited by capitalism, the ways in which you've been made and oppressed and the violence that's been done onto your bodies because of capitalism, they don't ever want to talk about it because that will implicate them into that system. Because now they have to take their own race privilege seriously. They have to take their own class privilege seriously. But they're Marxists. Right? And that goes against the very spirit of dialectic materialism, of you engaging your world from where you are and your positionality. So that is absolutely important. That's why someone like Angela Davis's work on race, class, and gender is so important. Because what she does is she takes the question of intersectionality, which, well, it was before the term intersectionality really becomes a thing. She calls it race, class, and gender, uh, race, class, and gender precisely because she is situating it within the struggle that is happening in the day. Right? And that's why it's not something that's lifted out of it. It's within the struggle of the most ex exploited and the most oppressed in the world. So that is something. In terms of, and, and that is why I think we still can say something that is different about slavery in terms of the conditions of the length of labor and so on. But that does not mean the harshness of people's lives as migrant laborers want. I mean, people were using a discourse. But what is, what, what is I mean, if you read, have you, have you read Night Trains by Charles Van Onselen? It's an excellent book that looks at the, the migrants coming across from Mozambique 
you know, close to 22 million migrant laborers coming across to work in our mines here, and not a cent has gone back to Mozambique or Mozambicans, and it's only basically made bloody, what's that, Ashanti gold rich, and no one else. So that's a, a, it's, a, it's a horrendous, horrendous, it's a deeply, deeply horrendous system of labor. Absolutely. And that speaks to what you are talking about, this extraction economy, and the ways in which certain sites are then rendered powerless, like the I like the rural sites and the urban sites become the sites of power because what you do is you come and labor here and you go home and you are now a person with money yourself so you are now rechanging the power relations with that so internally we are creating different sites of power and they come to mean different things in different people's lives and in the hierarchy of our society so that's constantly happening and that's not necessarily colonialism but it's how capitalism works and colonialism is one of the systems that capitalism has used to do this. Is this clear? Am I, okay. All right. <laughs> that brings us to the end of the talk. Thank you so much, Rajna. Well it's done. so refreshing to to learn about things um, where you also find yourself. So when you were talking about landlessness and powerlessness, I saw myself. I saw myself as a fourth generation on a farm um, with a heritage of farm workers, mm -hmm. black farm workers on white-owned farms. Mm -hmm. And also when you were talking about the independence date, um, independence debt um, of 1825, um, I, I saw the linkage between my experience and what was happening because even now I'm battling um, yes. with this notion of landlessness and powerlessness. I'm sitting with a story um, that I want to write about my experiences growing up on a farm or white owned farm as a, as a black person um, and seeing generations of people dying in poverty. So if you go to the grave sites on the farm, the grave sites of my grandparents look exactly like they lived with nothing. There's a sense of nothingness. And you go to the grave sites of the generation of, of farm owners, they're beautiful. Um, and so when you said that, um, and I'm, I'm having this difficulty because for me to write that story with my family still living on the farm, there's a cost for that freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I related all of those to, to my own experiences. So it's, it's really refreshing. I mean, I went, you know this, I went through a whole degree of international relations. And my frustration has always been, everyone is telling me about BRICS and, and all these emerging countries, but no one is telling me about the cost, um, the cost um, inequalities in India. No one is telling me um, about the experiences of the MST in Brazil. No one is telling me about the inequality in South Africa. So I was learning about all these different countries, um, but I wasn't finding myself. And, um, and today you helped me think through those things by actually understanding it as um, internationalism. So internationalism is a way to think about it because internationalism gets you to think about the similarities and the unifying factors um, which, you know, although international relations, you know, does talk about people-to-people -people relations, but, you know, it's about statehood, it's about the nation, it's about what mm -hmm. is different. Um, and, you know, when, also when you made, sorry, I'm going to end now, also when you made, um, when you asked us about, you know, the, the, the military camps of, of Umkondo, um, where seas were, and where, where, and, and where they were, whether there were any camps in South Africa. But you also see what's happening right now uh, with the military veterans of, of, of the MK. Mm -hmm. um, and so you think about, you know, at what point are hardships um, thought about hierarchically? Why is it that um, we don't ask the questions when people, or when we think about migrants, we don't ask the questions, why? What are the conditions that bring them? In what ways? What are the unifying factors? Um, and and so, so this was very important for me. It also was quite refreshing, but, but it, 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 it made me think um, about all the other things that, you know, that I'm thinking about, but it also um, gave me tools to think through my own difficulties about life, but also gave me tools um, 
to, to think about internationalism and why it is important to know this history um, and, 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 and how we can start from a point of, 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 of thinking about unif uh, the unifying factors, uh, but also the important histories that unfortunately, even a person like myself who went through a whole degree of international re relations, these histories, um, these internationalist stories, these types of solidarities, this agency, it's, impo it's important for, especially for the kind of work that we're trying to do at the Forge. So um, we are really happy, we're delighted, um, and quite excited that this was um, our inaugural lecture. It, I mean, talk, it, it really helped us, um, you know, to be able, and I'm sure others were also joining us through the live stream option. Um, I think it, it was, it, it, this is very important work, um, and this is not the last that we're going to be seeing of you. <laughs> so thank you everyone who is here, thank you for the questions, um, and also thank you to, to all the people that are joining us through the live stream option. Have a wonderful evening, and thank you once again, Mashna. Thank you everyone.